Okay, so now we will continue with the next session. Again, everything is about acquisition, and when we talk about flow and clinical flow, then obviously Doppler imaging is one of the ways that we can get information on velocities that we can do it in vivo. And it's my pleasure to introduce Alberto Gomez, who is working in King's College, and he's one of the engineers really working in the hospital and is really closely working with physicians and has a lot of experience on Doppler and also on how difficult it sometimes is to even just get imaging data out of the machine in order to do something with it. And so, Alberto, please. Okay, thank you, Bart, for the introduction and thanks uh, for the invitation. Um, so, uh, as Bart was saying, I'm gonna be talking about flow and how you can use ultrasound uh, in the clinic to measure flow and also how you um, can actually go further and do things that are not yet implemented into the clinic, but hopefully will be to do more interesting stuff with flow. So um, the first thing I wanted to, to try to uh, clarify is what actually is flow. So in preparation for this talk, I was talking with a friend who knows nothing about engineering. And I asked him, can you send me a picture from your standpoint that summarizes or explains what flow is? And he sent me this. Um, OK, ice is broken now, so this is not what I was after, but I thought it was funny, so I just put it there. Uh, this is what I think of when I think uh, uh, of flow. So flow is something that can be really complex, uh, that is definitely 3D and varying over time in general. So we need a, a formal way of defining this mathematically if we want to do some engineering with it. So mathematically, or uh, more formally, blood flow can be described as the motion of particles. And if we are looking into cardiovascular flow, it's the motion of blood particles uh, throughout the cardiovascular system. So in terms of what we can measure and how we can mathematically characterize flow, there are two quantities that um, I'm mostly interested in. And actually, we can derive one from the other. So the first one would be velocity, flow velocity. And this is a vector field. Uh, you can think of it as a collection of arrows that vary over time and space, uh, V there. And essentially, the direction of the arrow tells you the direction where particles are moving. And the magnitude of the arrow is how fast the flow is, is, is moving. Uh, the other quantity that is very interesting, uh, particularly in the clinic, is the volume rate, or also called flow rate. And this measures the amount of flow, uh, the amount of particles that go through a surface uh, per time unit. So before continuing, I wanted to just clarify one thing about flow rate. So if you consider this a scenario. Oh, sorry. OK, sorry. Can, can you hear me now? Yes? yes? All right. So uh, flow rate uh, is a global quantity uh, over time, a scalar value over time. And it's calculated as the amount of flow or the, or the velocity of this flow that goes through a surface. And something that is very important, and we will come back to this in a second, is that when you calculate this, this measurement should be independent of uh, what surface you choose. So in this case, you have this surface, but it could be any other tilted, uh, tilted surface. The only thing that matters is if you define a vector perpendicular to this surface, the only component of the velocity that influences or contributes to flow rate is the component parallel to this vector n. So velocity has three components, but you only need one to calculate flow rate. And we will see later on why this is important. OK, so now that uh, we have defined flow, how do we measure flow? There is uh, many methods and many techniques to uh, estimate and measure flow. We have seen some this morning, and we will see some more later on. These are some methods that are not, or not very much used uh, today, or at least in the clinic anyways. I won't describe them, but I just wanted you to have them as a reference. Uh, on top of this, there is uh, also, of course, uh, flow MRI, which we will hear about later and uh, which is really impressive what uh, people can do with it these days. But today I'm gonna talk about Doppler ultrasound, uh, which is arguably the most uh, widely used uh, method for measuring flow, uh, at least cardiovascular flow uh, in, in, in vivo. And hopefully throughout this talk, I will convince you that this is a very good technique to use. So how does uh, Doppler ultrasound work? Well, uh, you probably are familiar with ultrasound, but I thought it would be important to cover uh, a bit of how ultrasound is acquired, uh, because this will tell us about what are the limitations and what are the features of, of ultrasound that make it good for flow measurement. So 
very briefly, ultrasound is acquired with an ultrasound transducer, which looks uh, like the picture on the right. And for my diagrams, I represent this as the diagram on the left. So it's a collection of piezoelectric crystals. These are the little squares on the surface. And these crystals uh, have the property that when excited with an electrical pulse, will vibrate and will propagate a pressure wave into the tissue. But also when they receive a pressure wave from the tissue, they will create an impulse, uh, an electrical impulse. So this way we can send waves and receive waves. Uh, so for example, if I excite only one element, uh, as in the figure, the red one is the active one, uh, I'm doing a lot of simplifications and assumptions, but uh, for understanding, I think it's okay. A uh, spherical wave will be generated at this element and will be propagated into the tissue. So if you excite not one, but two elements at the same time, then two waves are generated and they interfere coherently, they sum up, and then you have a different wave uh, form. You can do this with many elements, uh, and it's of particular interest the case in which these elements are not all excited at the same time, but you have some delay pattern. So you see these ones go before and then the ones in the center go after. This creates a parabolic um, uh, delay pattern. So the wave is no longer, it's, it's actually focused on one point at a certain depth. So you hopefully can see that the wave is converging here. And then by changing these delays, this wave can be made to converge uh, before or even closer to the transducer. And the reason why this is important is because uh, when you have, say, a particle and you want to make a picture which shows where the particle is, if you focus your wave adequately, both uh, laterally, so you choose the right uh, sort of line that goes by the particle, then you will receive a strong uh, echo back and then you can have a nice picture. And this is also important because if, if instead of just one, you have multiple targets, as in this case, uh, by focusing your target adequately and your wave adequately and by choosing the line where you want to scan, most of the signal will come from here. Uh, so you won't capture this uh, using this specific wave and this gives us lateral resolution. So it will give you the ability to resolve uh, for uh, lateral direction, which is this direction here. Um, so with this in mind, uh, the way we make an ultrasound image is just uh, do this over and over, so send a focus wave, uh, one line after the other. So this is how the lines would cover the space. And once you have gone through the entire image, you end up with a, a, an image of the particles that you have, as you see on the right-hand side. Okay, so this is how you make uh, an image and in 2D. And if you want to do in 3D, you can as well with ultrasound. And there are basically two ways of doing this. So the first way is what you see on the left. It's, it's called mechanically steered uh, transducers. So essentially it's a 2D transducer that is steered uh, with, a, with a little motor and you acquire a collection of 2D slices, you put them together and you have a 3D image. The other option is shown on the right, is called uh, phase uh, uh, matrix arrays. So this is, instead of just having uh, a line of elements, you have a sort of chessboard of elements as depicted here, and this allows you to choose your line not only on a plane, but on 3D, uh, roughly. So then you will end up with a 3D image as well. And uh, these two systems have different properties. Uh, for what I will show uh, from now on, when I use 3D, I'm using this technique, okay, the phase-based array. So uh, we have seen so far how you make an image, but we are interested in flow. So when you want to measure something dynamically changing, such as flow, you have to consider what is the frame rate of your acquisition system. Uh, so let's try to figure out what is the frame rate that we can get with ultrasound. And we can do so by putting together a few numbers, uh, for example. So basically th the limiting factor here is the speed of sound uh, because we have to send an echo, wait until the echo comes back, and the echo travels at a certain speed, which is the speed of sound. Uh, this speed of sound depends on the tissue uh, or on the material you are looking into. And in human tissue, it's roughly 1,450 meter per second, perhaps a bit higher depending on the tissue. But essentially, if you want to go to see, for example, the heart, in patients, you normally go deep up to 15 or perhaps 18 centimeters. Uh, so the time it takes to acquire just one line, uh, you have to multiply times the number of lines you're acquiring, say 64. And this is just an example because we, you can go actually to a much higher number. But if you do this, uh, then it takes about 16 milliseconds to acquire one single image. And there are many techniques that can improve this uh, a little bit. And we will see some that can improve this actually a lot. But for now, let's assume that 16 milliseconds is a standard frame rate in a clinical kit. So this allows you to get about 60 frames per second. So now 
the natural question to ask is, is this enough to look into flow? So if it wasn't, what am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> well, it is not enough, actually. Um, but yes, we can do something with it. Um, the reason why this is not enough uh, is for two reasons. So the first reason is blood can move, uh, for example, in the aortic outflow in a healthy patient, it will be about 1.5 meter per second or, or even higher. And in disease patients, it can be actually much, much higher. Uh, so if you are at 60 frames per second and you're looking into a particle of blood, this particle can move like 2.5 centimeters. And we know from the previous talk that uh, you can track perhaps displacements that are just a few pixels. So this would be in standard ultrasound resolution, perhaps 30, 40 pixels easily. Uh, so of course you are not gonna be able to track it so far. Plus the fact that blood is a 3D phenomena. So if you are doing 2D ultrasound and you wait this long, your particle for sure has, has gone out of plane. And actually the other interesting uh, thing is that we, we don't see blood in ultrasound. So if you see this picture which shows, uh, so this is a parsternal long axis view of the heart. Uh, this is the left ventricle here, this is the aortic valve, and this is the mitral valve, so the atrium here, the blood goes this way to the ventricle and then gets ejected through the mitral valve. Uh, also, I make use of this image to sort of uh, advertise how good ultrasound is in terms of resolution. So if you want to do this with MRI, good luck. Uh, but the thing is that we don't really see blood. And the reason for that is that the signal coming from tissue is so much stronger than blood that uh, all we see is, is tissue. Okay, this doesn't mean that we don't receive signal from blood, we do, and we use that to measure blood flow, but in normal images we don't see it. So how can we measure blood uh, if, if all these problems uh, are there? Well, let's, let's have a quick look at what happens when we try to make a picture of something that moves with ultrasound. So first let's imagine that we are sending uh, continuously a wave, uh, and uh, this wave is being scattered by a particle that doesn't move. So if this is the case, then the frequency of the wave that we send is the same as the frequency of the wave that we receive, and we are all good. Now, if the particle is moving, for example, moving away from the transducer, what happens is that the wave is getting compressed along the direction where the particle is moving, and it's getting spread in the other direction. So we will still receive some echo, but it's like the particle is leaving the echo away uh, behind. So the frequency that we receive will be lower, uh, the wavelength that we receive will be higher. And if we can then compare the, frame, uh, the frequency that we receive with the frequency that we send, and they are different, then we can figure out the velocity. And as you know, this is known as the Doppler effect. Uh, so just one precision about the Doppler effect, which also is quite uh, important for what we are gonna do now. Uh, because we are just relying on waves being sort of compressed or, or spread uh, due to motion uh, when we receive them. Uh, we have to take into account that we only notice or we only measure whether a particle is going away or towards us. But we don't know with, with uh, which exact direction. And actually this is quite important because, for example, if the particle is moving perpendicular to the line along which we are measuring, we won't notice any, any difference in the frequency. So we will think that the particle is not moving at all. Uh, so in other words, we only measure one component of the velocity, and this is illustrated here. So for example, if the velocity, the flow is going to the right, and we are uh, scanning with our ultrasound system along this direction, what we measure, m here, is just the projection of this velocity along this line. So depending on our angle of insonation, we will measure a different value. So then, effectively what we measure is the true velocity magnitude weighted by the cosinus of the angle between the two, the flow direction and the ultrasound beam direction. Okay, um, and this is very important. So if you haven't got, or, or if you don't remember anything up to here, at least remember this, okay? This is the one very important thing so far. Okay, so moving on, how do we use this in the clinical practice? Uh, so there are two types of Doppler uh, that we use. One is continuous wave Doppler, the other one pulse wave Doppler. You probably have heard about this uh, already. I'll very briefly say that pulse wave Doppler is what we normally use. Uh, and the difference between the two is continuous wave Doppler does, is, is sending a wave constantly. So when you receive an echo, you don't know when this echo was sent because they are being sent all the time. And because you don't know when it was sent, you don't know how long it took uh, or how deep it went. So you cannot resolve in depth. You don't know basically where the echo was generated. So if you want to locate in space where you're measuring your velocity, you have to send 
uh, echo in a pulsed way so that you know when this echo was sent. And as a result, instead of receiving a continuous wave, you, you basically receive a, a burst of pulses. And when you try to mix it with the, your reference signal to figure out what is the phase shift, you end up with a signal that looks a bit like this. So essentially, your goal is to figure out the frequency of this signal. And each of the pulses that you send is just one sample in the signal. So by the Nyquist theorem, you can only measure a frequency which is uh, at the most half the frequency of your pulses. Uh, of the pulses that you receive. What this means basically is that the maximum velocity that we can measure with Doppler, uh, pulse wave Doppler is limited by this uh, phenomena, by this pulse repetition frequency, and therefore there is a maximum velocity we can measure, and beyond that there is aliasing. And more graphically what that means is, just think for a moment that this is your wave, um, you are, this is the velocity over time, and we have this velocity that we can measure, then we measure it as it is, of course with the angle compensation thing, but it can be that the maximum velocity we can measure with our system is lower than the maximum actual velocity, and then aliasing occurs, and this uh, is, is captured as folding of the wave, uh, so the positive values go back to negative and so on, and this is what we measure. And this actually is, is, is a problem, it's, it's, it's always present, or often present, because for example, the maximum velocity we can measure normally in the clinic with a Doppler ultrasound transducer will be of the order as well of 1.5 meter per second, um, which is of the order of the velocities that we are sometimes interested in measuring. So this, this is not exceptional. This happens very often, and even more so with uh, deceased patients. Um, but the good thing is that we can locate in space, like I said before, where the velocity came from. And because we can locate in a space where the velocity came from, we can actually draw a map of velocities, and this is called color Doppler imaging, which looks like this. So this is using similar, basically, pulse wave Doppler, uh, but in all points of the space within this area here, this color box, and then we just give a color to the velocity that we measure, blue if it's going away from the transducer, or red if it's going towards the transducer. Um, and this is an example of aliasing happening in color Doppler imaging, so in this case, the flow is going down. It's not that it changes directions here suddenly. It's just because the velocity is so high, higher than the maximum velocity we can measure, it appears uh, with opposite sign. Uh, so we just have, clinicians normally are aware of this and just keep this in, in, into account for, for their uh, measurements. And this is just an example of this uh, being done over time. Okay, so this is uh, basically how ultrasound works, how Doppler ultrasound works. How do we use this to actually measure, quantify flow? So I'm gonna cover a few standard techniques, so what people actually use in the clinic, and then I'll move on to perhaps more interesting stuff, more emerging, more research-oriented things. So in the clinic, basically color Doppler imaging that I just saw is, is, is very rarely used. Or if it is used, it's used more qualitatively. So just to look and have an idea of what flow looks like, but. Clinicians in general don't draw any numbers out of it. Uh, there are some exceptions, but I'm, I'm always talking in general. Uh, so what they use is this uh, pulse wave Doppler or continuous wave Doppler, depending to, to quantify flow in specific areas, normally in vessels, uh, in heart inlets or outlets. And actually it's not much they, they measure with this. Um, in summary, it would be the maximum velocity uh, or the peak velocity. Then they use a simplified version of the Bernoulli equation, uh, which basically translates peak velocity into pressure drop. And then actually oftentimes when they talk, uh, talk to each other, they talk about peak velocity and pressure drop indistinctly, indistinctly, indistinctly as if it was the same thing. It, it means the same thing from a clinical perspective to them. Um, and actually most of the times they don't even compensate for the angle. They just uh, try to align the beam with the vessel direction and that's it. Uh, other things that they do is also more qualitatively is look at uh, waveform pattern. So this would be the typical inflow pattern. So you have an active phase or a passive phase in the ventricular filling and then an active phase. So first velocity of blood coming into the ventricle is higher and then a bit lower. So by comparing this wave with a sort of atlas they have of what these waves should look like or could look like for different diseases, they can make some assessment of, of uh, cardiac condition. And then for the more adventurous clinicians, they would go and, and, and do some more advanced measurements, which basically is just drawing a line on the waveform and 
then they not only have the peak velocity, but the actual average velocity over the entire cardiac cycle. And this can help them estimate, for example, average gradients uh, at the region. And sometimes they even measure the diameter of a vessel. And then assuming it's circular, they can calculate flow rate, assuming that the profile of the velocity is parabolic and so on and so forth. And, and that's pretty much it. So this, is, this probably covers 90 plus percent of all the clinical assessment that is done routinely using Doppler ultrasound. And I think this is important to know because, you know, we sometimes as engineers develop things that are rocket science, but, you know, it has to be used to, to be useful. If it's not used, it's, it's, it's quite useless. So I think the key to making something that can be used is it has to be easy to use, fast, uh, or, or at least give an answer in clinically compatible times. And it has to not require an engineer to be there all the time because then it won't be implemented uh, widely. So that said, I'm going to talk now about things that are a bit more uh, exciting, at least from an engineering perspective, than this. Um, so the first thing I'm going to cover is how you make measurements and quantification which does not depend on the angle. So of course, the first thing you can do is just compensate for the angle yourself. So you estimate what is the direction of the flow by thinking or assuming that it goes following the vessel, which uh, is a reasonably uh, or a reasonable assumption to make. Uh, and then you just divide whatever you measure by the cosinus of this angle between the vessel and the transducer. And then this will have an amplifying effect in the flow or the velocity that you measure. So this is the simplest compensation you can do. And most uh, machines have this built in uh, so you can do it in the clinic. Now, uh, a bit more advanced than this is what I said at the beginning. So if you want to estimate flow rate, you don't really need all the components of the velocity. You only need one, which is the component perpendicular to the surface you want to measure. So if you have 2D color Doppler, for example, your velocity will be measured along these uh, green arrows. So actually, it is absolutely impossible to have a surface that includes the entire vessel and is perpendicular to these points because it would be contained in the vessel. So what you can do is you can use 3D Doppler. So if you have your ultrasound uh, field of view uh, like this, cutting the vessel, so you have spherical caps, which are surfaces like this, and the velocity that you measure will be measured perpendicular to this uh, sphere, or actually along the radiuses if you want. So you can use this sphere to calculate flow, and then you have the component of the velocity that is parallel to the perpendicular vector of the surface, and you can do uh, angle independent flow quantification. Uh, so this is some work we did in the past using this technique. So placing a spherical cap, this is what a color Doppler image in 3D looks like. And this can give you some accurate results. This also has been taken over by some uh, vendors, so not my actual work, but similar work. And this is examples of clinically usable systems uh, that are available in some ultrasound machines. And well, of course, they, you have to select the, your slice or, or your spherical cap. Uh, sometimes this can be done using computational models that automatically fit uh, the images that you are taking and so on and so forth. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't know any clinician that uses this routinely, but it is available. Um, so this is about flow quantification angle independent. And then now the other thing about uh, measuring blood flow that I think is, is even more interesting is how to measure velocity fields. And we have seen examples of this yesterday, uh, also this morning with optical imaging. And uh, the idea is that you can measure the actual velocity at every point uh, in, in, the in, the, in a plane or in the space if you do some tricks with uh, your Doppler imaging. So just some fundamental ideas behind all the methods that I will show. So the first thing is that ultrasound, Doppler ultrasound can measure one component of the velocity. So it follows that if we can do many measurements of ultrasound, then we can measure many components. And if we can put them together, we might be able to recover the whole velocity field. Um, and this is normally called vector flow imaging or vector flow mapping. So the, the goal here is to find what are the missing components that we cannot measure with Doppler, with standard Doppler at least. And then apart from trying to imaging from different views to get different um, components, uh, you can do things like trying to trick your ultrasound system and make it uh, able to detect Doppler shift laterally as well or you can try to incorporate some physics or some modeling into the reconstruction so that you can constrain your data with a model of how flow should behave to get the missing components. 
or you can actually do particle tracking. And this is what uh, was mentioned before, echo PIV, which actually is not PIV, uh, but it's a bit similar. So because PIV was established, uh, so people thought using the same name could help uh, publicizing it a bit more, I suppose. Um, so it, it does track some particles, so it's fair enough. But that's another method. So I will first try to cover what you can do with standard kit, and then we'll move on to something that you can do with non-standard kit. So the first, one of the first approaches to estimate uh, velocity fields in 2D, uh, the first obvious application, uh, I think, has always been the carotid artery. And if you think back of uh, the, the keynote uh, speaker on Monday, uh, so she was talking about how uh, the, in bifurcations you can have some issues with uh, clots or thrombos that can appear and that there's a tight relation between the risk in the patient and how flow is affecting that area. So of course it's very important to measure flow here. Uh, and this uh, particular work consisted of basically taking ultrasound images, double ultrasound of this region from two different angles and then reconstructing by triangulation the resulting vectors. And this is proof that you can do this. Uh, and to, for mathematical stability you can use some regularization uh, based on the physics behind flow. Um, but this is done with standard 2D ultrasound. Uh, but you need two images, so you need to either move the probe uh, because you cannot uh, put two transducers at the same time, the waves would interfere. So you, can, you have to move the probe and then you have to know the relative position of the two probes, so it's, it can be a complex problem. Um, another alternative is transverse oscillation. So this is a technique which is also actively investigated nowadays. And the idea is uh, uh, basically that you can uh, change the way your wave is acquired or your image is acquired if you can, so that you will be sensitive to motion on laterally. Uh, so if you remember from what I said about the Doppler effect, you can only measure velocity that goes along this direction. And basically this is because your point spread function uh, has some oscillations or it's a pressure wave, so it is oscillating as the wave propagates. It doesn't oscillate laterally, so there is no frequency shift laterally. But if you, can ha if you can make your wave to oscillate laterally somehow, then in theory you can measure this component of velocity as well. So the way you can do this is uh, by something called apodization. So apodization consists of basically weighting the intensity of the pulses that come out. So in this case, this curve this red curve here uh, shows that you are giving more weight to the signal coming from this element, perhaps zero weight here and then more weight here. And um, very similar to what we hear, heard before uh, in ultrasound, if you're in the far field, so basically for our interests anywhere in your image domain, uh, further a few centimeters from the surface, the point spread function that you will get is the Fourier transform of your apodization uh, uh, function. So if, if your apodization looks like this, so like two peaks more or less, then your Fourier transform will have actually, will be a sinus, yeah? So it, it will be an oscillation, sinusoidal oscillation uh, laterally. And then the bigger your aperture, the higher frequency this can have. Okay? Uh, if you want, you can think of this intuitively in a different way. So what we are doing here is exciting these elements, these elements and not these elements. So it's like if you had two transducers, one here, and one here. So you are measuring from two directions and then you are resolving a vector, okay? So what is happening is what I said first. This is just the intuition behind it. And also I think it's useful, this intuition, because it helps you figure out what is the limitation of this method, which is you can do this for sur uh, surface vessels. If you go deeper, then the angle between these two beams gets very, very small. And then your two views are less and less independent from each other. So the accuracy will decrease. Uh, and you are limited by how big your aperture is. Uh, but, you know, people can do this in, in, in the, um, for example, in the carotid arteries, and you can resolve your flow, and then you are not limited, but you, you recover the two components with only one transducer. Other things you can do uh, is something called echo dynamography. This uh, and the next technique are, are very tightly related. Uh, so we heard yesterday something about splitting flows into two, uh, flow fields, one which is uh, vortex only, and other one which is the laminar component, and when you sum the two, you have the flow that you're measuring. So this technique um, 
basically aims, uh, well, does a lot of assumptions. For example, it assumes that this vortex is symmetric, and then by using the, which perhaps is, is fair enough in, in, in many cases. So using this assumption, you can figure out the components that you don't have in, the, in this uh, flow. And then for the laminar flow, you just assume that there's no through plane flow. So using this continuity equation, pretty much in the same way we saw before, you can resolve this and then you sum them up again and you end up with your flow field. So it will look a bit like this. And I personally don't think this is particularly accurate, but uh, it has the advantage that it only needs the Doppler data and also it, it has been already implemented in some commercial systems. And I, I'm not sure how widely used this is, but it, it does exist. Now, actually more used than this and partly related is the work by uh, Dr. Bermejo and uh, who was speaking yesterday and Damien Garcia, uh, which is, uh, you can call this just vector flow uh, imaging. And I won't get too much into the details because it was explained yesterday, but the idea is that if you can combine the motion of the wall that you can track from anatomical images with the one component that you get in Doppler ultrasound, you can use the continuity equation to recover flow. And the idea is that the way the wall moves constrains the way flow moves. So because your flow is incompressible, or you assume it is incompressible, if you think of it as the wall, for example, when it moves away from the fluid, the fluid has to follow. Otherwise, there will be void. So the fluid has to follow. Or if the, the wall pushes the flow along this direction, then the flow also has to be displaced. It cannot permeate through the wall. And so what that means is that the component of the velocity perpendicular to the wall has to be the same both in uh, the flow and in the wall. You can measure it from the wall. This will give you the initial condition for this transverse velocity. And the other component of the velocity, you have it from Doppler. So solving this equation, you get this flow. And then you can do all the fantastic things that uh, Dr. Bermejo was showing uh, yesterday. Uh, so this is in 2D. Well, and, and then last is the famous uh, echo PIV. So this essentially is just uh, injecting some tracers, some particles which uh, are normally uh, micro bubbles into the bloodstream. And then these bubbles will be shiny and we will be able to dis distinguish them in a 2D image and then we can track them. Uh, and then if you do that, then you can recover vortices and visualize them in, in different ways. But essentially, you, you need a contrast uh, agent. So that's the main disadvantage. Um, and then, of course, you still are not solving these problems of particles going out of plane if, if they do. So this is in, in 2D. You can do some things in 3D as well. And this is some work we did a few years ago. So the idea is if you can do 3D color Doppler, then you can have one component in a volume, not only in, in one plane. And by combining at least three different views, each one will contribute with one component. And when you align them together, these components will be different. And then combining this with wall motion, you can get uh, intraventricular flow in 3D. And then you repeat this over time, and then your flow will be 4D. Um, so you can do this without using the, the wall motion as well. But if you do that, you need to have perfect overlap of all the Doppler views over the entire ventricle. And this is very challenging because basically your frame rate in Doppler, because you need to send many pulses, is less than in, in a normal anatomical image. And additionally, if you want to keep up with a decent frame rate, then you have to narrow your field of view, and mo even more so in 3D. Um, so normally, your images are quite thin. So here you can compare the size of an anatomical image and a Doppler image. So it will only be a fraction of, of the size of this one. And these figures here represent overlaps. So this is the ideal case. White is where the three views overlap, and then the different shades of gray mean overlap of only two views or just one view, and sometimes even no view at all. So this is the ideal case. This actually is taken from real clinical cases. So most of the times, there are bits of the ventricle that are not covered. Uh, and if you try to reconstruct blood flow, this is just a 2D slice of the reconstructed flow, um, well, you will have lots of errors. So in the first row, it's just using the Doppler data. But then if you incorporate wall motion to constrain the problem, you can actually find your vortices, again, uh, with more or less accuracy, but at least the shape of your flow is correct. So we did this, and then uh, we tried to see what this can give us. So this is an example of visualization. In this case, we reconstructed flow just in the, actually in the, in the tunnel or in the uh, channel that goes from the atrium to the ventricle. So this would be, in this case, it's the tricuspid valve because it's a specific case uh, of disease patients where the systemic ventricle is the right ventricle. 
Uh, and basically, just for visualization, we seeded some particles in the atrium and saw that they were going towards the ventricle. Uh, this is not of clinical significance, this particular example, but it's nice to, to see whether our results were somehow consistent. And then the flow is not reconstructed here, so it's, quite, it's meaningless what the particles are doing after, after the, the valve. Um, we did this as well in the whole ventricle in, whoops, in pediatric patients. So this is a case of a pediatric patient. This and this represent the same field. This is just a 2D slice of the flow getting into the ventricle and being ejected. And this is trying to have a 3D visualization of the vortex. So this was uh, using streamlines uh, along, the, along the, vo the velocity field in 3D. And then we wanted to do something a bit more meaningful clinically. Uh, so we tried to see whether we could establish differences in the vortex shape between uh, different patient groups. So these are all right ventricular, uh, systemic right ventricle patients, uh, hypoplastic left heart. And some of these patients have a ventricle, right ventricle, that in shape looks uh, a bit like an ellipsoid. So more or less similar to what a normal left ventricle would look like. But some of these patients, uh, because the left ventricle grows a little bit, then the right ventricle is elongated and has this uh, asymmetric shape. So by using this technique, we reconstructed vortices in two different, uh, well, in, in I think five or six patients. This is just two examples. So what we show, this is as the cycli, cy uh, cardiac cycle goes. Uh, so we saw that the vortex was forming more or less in a normal way in the patients with this shape of ventricle. But in patients where the ventricle ha was elongated, the vortex only formed on one side. And actually, this is highly inefficient. And these patients both actually will need some surgery. But then using these techniques can help clinicians decide what surgery would be best uh, to correct for these issues. Um, so then some limitations of these methods. So one main limitation is frame rate. So I said that, uh, well, 60 frames per second can be good. Uh, Doppler ultrasound, uh, pulse wave Doppler, and color Doppler imaging have less frame rate because you have to send many pulses. So then you are already being a bit compromised, and then you have to start acquiring over many cycles and averaging and so on. Uh, so we, hear, we heard yesterday that for the studies that Dr. Bermejo was doing, he was acquiring uh, many cycles and then interleaving to get sufficient frame rate. And ideally, you want to not have to do that. Uh, also, 3D methods are very, very limited, both in frame rate and also in resolution, in accuracy, uh, and um, so yeah, and, and then th th there are a number of issues you have to calculate uh, wall tracking and so on. So this is all very nice, but can we do better? And this is where I think things get really, really interesting. And this is where I introduced ultra-fast ultrasound, and I think this is really the future of ultrasound because it, it can help overcome many of the limitations that we have now. It enables very, very fast acquisition, and this then solves at least partly the issues we have with frame rate, uh, with uh, Doppler, the maximum velocity we can measure with Doppler, uh, and enables a whole new thing, uh, set of things that we couldn't do before. Um, so I'm going to show a few examples following the same trend as before. So first 2D, carotids, and moving on into intracardiac flows. Uh, so how does ultra-fast ultrasound work? Well, actually, surprisingly, or perhaps not, is, is simpler in concept than standard ultrasound. So uh, basically, the way it works is instead of focusing our weight, we actually excite, well, this is one way this can work, okay? Uh, the, the main idea behind is that instead of sending a wave that is focused in one direction, you send a wave that will in sound the whole space. So all the things that you want to look at will uh, be swapped or invaded by the sound wave, and then you will receive data from everywhere at once. And one way to achieve this is by sending a plane wave uh, from the transducer, which you can achieve by setting the same delay in all elements, for example. And then this wave will propagate and will touch all the scatters if you want in your space, and then the wave will come back. If you do this, then you don't have to go line by line. You can do just one line for everything. Uh, so as you see, it can be simpler. So if it's simpler, why weren't we doing this before? Well, uh, I guess you, you lose, uh, well, you need to come up with a way to find your lateral resolution to start with. But also, if you have to keep up with the frame rate and reconstruct your image in real time, you need a very, very high computational uh, power. And this wasn't available to us until recently with the advent of GPUs and, and so on. Uh, 
So how fast can we make pictures if we use this technique? Well, it's basically using the same calculation we did before, but just dividing by the number of lines, because now we only need one line. Using the same numbers, you would get 4,000 frames per second. And this is not a typo, it's really 4,000 frames per second. And actually, this is if you want to go all the way to 18 centimeters, but if you want to do carotid, which is just a few centimeters down, you can go to 10,000 or even 15,000 frames per second. So ultrasound already was the fastest modality, at least compared to MRI and so on, and now I, I, I actually doubt that the MRI will ever catch up to this. I, this is very fast. So if, if you would acquire a standard, just to give you an idea of how fast this is, if you take a standard ultrasound image, um, say 60 frames, and you play it uh, with all the frames you would have uh, using this, a single heartbeat would take a couple of minutes to reproduce. So you can imagine the slow motion movie that that would generate. It's, it's really fast. Um, so what uh, can we do with this to measure flows? Well, one of the first methods that used this uh, was this one here, where basically because we can measure with such a high frame rate, we actually don't need to do Doppler anymore. We can track blood because the displacement is now very, very small. And if you do that, then you measure both components at the same time. So there you go, you have a highly time resolved uh, with high spatial resolution description of the flow in the, in the carotid. Uh, so these techniques were improved, of course. And then uh, you have uh, simultaneous tracking of the wall and, and the carotid bifurcation. Um, so in this case, instead of just sending a plane wave and tracking particles, this was done, or, or tracking the blood, sorry, this was done using Doppler, but because you can tilt the wave that you send, you can tilt it uh, in two different directions. So it's like having two different Doppler views and combining them to calculate your vectors, you get this. Um, but you are not limited to only two angles. You can send as many waves as you want and you can send uh, a few from different angles and then of course, one wave illuminates not only a plane, but actually the whole space. So in theory, you don't lose temporal resolution when you go to 3D. So it's as fast in 3D as in 2D. In reality, this is not really the case because your signal to noise and your lateral resolution is low, so you need to send more waves. But there are people doing uh, ultra fast uh, ultrasound in the heart nowadays in 3D at a few hundred volumes per second. So it's still very, very fast. Uh, so this is an example uh, as well uh, uh, from uh, these uh, groups here where they uh, got this data. And actually, if you look at the literature on this, the, we have lots of papers which are just 2016, 2017, so it is a very, very hot topic now. And if you combine this with a fancy visualization, then you can see flows in the carotid uh, in an impressive way like this. So this is a normal subject and this is a disease subject. Uh, and then this is uh, actually slowed down uh, quite a lot so that you can appreciate the flow. But you can see in, in this case, actually, there is a, a clot here. So the flow cannot pass by properly. It accelerates abnormally. It will produce a lot of stress in the upper wall. Uh, but if you don't have that, the flow will be good. And this, this is measured with ultrasound. So um, I, I hope you agree that this is actually very nice. And if you can have this in the clinic, of course, I don't think it's implemented yet, but it will be shortly for sure. So this would be very useful. Uh, so now moving on to other applications or to intracardiac. Uh, there is uh, particularly the work by uh, Professor Lofstagen and his group in, in Trondheim. They are doing a lot of work in, uh, sorry, particularly in pediatric uh, imaging, uh, where they try to get uh, flow maps in the, in the, in the chil in children's hearts. And this is an example of what you can do with ultrasound, ultrafast ultrasound. In this case, it's through a defect. Uh, I believe this is uh, in the ventricle. So in between the two ventricles, there's a little hole. And it's quite important to measure what flow is going through that. And that's actually very challenging, but thanks to these techniques, you can do that. Uh, and this is another example where they use the same technique. Um, and now this is uh, moving on to trying to combine Doppler and speckle tracking. Uh, of blood because you have such a big frame rate. And doing that, uh, well, you can, to start with, get really nice pictures of, uh, of motion. So you can, use, you can track uh, the wall and you can track the speckles of blood. Unfortunately, we cannot see very well, but you do see the speckles of blood. Uh, so when you reconstruct this and you put some colors as if it was color Doppler imaging, just to show the direction, uh, you get this sort of visualization where you can see 
now so much more nicely uh, the particle, well, the, the, the flow uh, represented using these uh, particle tracking methods. And uh, you can even go to the ventricle and get really highly defined uh, vortices uh, and uh, basically dynamic images of intracardiac flows. And this is on a real subject, uh, a pediatric subject in the heart. And I think it's difficult to think this is going to get cooler than this, <laughs> but it will because uh, now the research is going towards uh, 3D imaging of vortices. Uh, this is not going to be the solution for everything. Ultrasound has many limitations, uh, particularly for uh, artifacts that you cannot get rid of, such as shadowing, uh, view-dependent artifacts, and so on. But there is lots coming up, and it's very promising as a measurement tool. So. We're getting to my last slide, uh, so I just want to do a summary. Basically, ultrasound is great. It's high frame rate, even standard ultrasound. You can acquire data in real time uh, in bedside. Uh, you don't need any fancy processing to get just simple flow measurements. Um, it has some limitations, uh, such as angle dependence, uh, aliasing, and so on, but it's very widely used. So any small improvement you can make in ultrasound can improve potentially the life of many more people than perhaps any other imaging modality, at least for cardiac care. Um, advanced ultrasound, particularly ultrafast ultrasound and the combination of structure, anatomy, and flow measurements can actually unveil a new world of new measurements that we can make um, for clinical use or to fit models. And just wanted to say at last that it's 2017 and I have got away with doing a talk in medical imaging without saying machine learning. So let's see if next year I can do the same. Um, so that's it, thank you so much. I'd like to acknowledge uh, people in, at King's that work with me, uh, the uh, Trondheim National University, Imperial College London, and I'd like to use one minute just to say a quick thing about Professor Peter Wells. So he's a researcher in London as well, and he unfortunately passed away a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so Peter Wells, is, uh, has a massive contribution to ultrasound in general, but he's sort of the grandfather uh, of pulse wave Doppler. So I think nothing of what I said today actually would have happened uh, without Peter Wells, or definitely would have taken much longer to happen. So I, I think it's right to acknowledge people who, who did such uh, huge contributions to, to science. And just with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. And indeed, as you said, like ultrasound is the bread and butter of cardiology. And you see, especially Doppler is quite useful. And if you see what's indeed going on currently in research in these high frame rates, yeah. it's extremely promising. So maybe we just don't know yet what we can do with ultrasound. So it's indeed a field which I think is very, very important to look at. Maybe just very, very briefly, what's your idea? Is like when you do this, this high frame rate imaging, everybody seems to jump onto the color Doppler in some ways and trying to improve color Doppler, improve the visualization. But what about improving pulse Doppler, for example, or doing it, making like at the same time acquisition of Dopplers from different valves or in kind of different planes or whatever? Yeah, yeah so I think that's a very good point and it's totally true. Um, so there are a few aspects I think that are important to consider. So the first one is clinicians like what they use and what they are used to using. So they like to see colors uh, for flow quantification to the point that actually we, act we had a clinician that wanted us to post-process flow MRI data to display it as colors <laughs> because it was used to color Doppler imaging. Uh, so that's perhaps one of the reasons why some effort has been driven into that. Uh, but then I think one of the potential uh, big impacts of this technique uh, different to Doppler imaging is valve imaging, so it's very challenging to look at valves because they are very small, they move very quickly, and there's a lot we don't know about them, so perhaps using um, ultrafast ultrasound for valves can, can enable new measurements that we don't have now. Um, so I think also because ultrasound is something that you use in real time, so people look at it and are already making a diagnosis as they are scanning, um, it, it seems like it might not have such a big impact in the clinic during the scan because you cannot see at these high frame rates. Uh, so I think possibly uh, it will be uh, sort of food for post-processing or for retrospective analysis of cases. Uh, but again, that's uh, up to 
up to the future to, to decide. We don't know yet. And what's your opinion about the use of, um, for example, a Doppler imaging together with simulations for regularization or as input for one of the other? Yeah, so I think well, one of the problems with, uh, with Doppler is that it, it is noisy and it's uh, not so accurate or not so sensitive sometimes. So most of the techniques I have shown require some sort of regularization. And this regularization is mostly based on, on models. Um, so I think, the, the, I think the, the big conflict between the two, and at least this is what I feel when I work with modelers, is that modelers normally have very clear what sort of inputs they need for the models. So for example, I have, just as an example, I have this case where we're trying to build cardiovascular or cardiac models of ventricular flow, and the modelers would ask me for the velocity in the inlet of the heart and in the outlet to make the model. And I was saying, but I have measurements everywhere in the ventricle. Why, why don't you get this, which is much more data, and then you can build a better model? I was like, no, the, the model doesn't work like this. Uh, I need the inlet and the outlet, and they will solve the equation. Um, so we argued a lot about this. Uh, in the end, uh, the modeler uh, won. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that's where we should go to. So try to make models that are more flexible in the data they need to take, uh, and that can take more data than they need uh, to make something closer to the data. So sort of use the model to regularize the data rather than the other way around. And also with models, it's like regularly um, people try to just model one heartbeat. But when you see it's from beat to beat, it's like one of the strengths of ultrasound is that it's real time mm. as compared to MRI, for example. And you can really look at variations of beat to beat or with irregular heart rates and things like that. And how do you see that the use of information from this then to try to use that to also again improve the models or explain mm. some of the things? Yeah. So. It, uh, it, it's true that uh, some techniques assume that your cardiac uh, beat is periodic and then you can average over many cycles and ultrasound doesn't need to do, particularly mm -hmm. ultrasound, ultrasound doesn't need to do these assumptions. And so I think there is place for investigating particularly changes in, in, in cardiac beat or cardiac rhythm under exercise or under irregular beats and so on. Um, the, the only problem with uh, ultrasound, and we haven't solved it yet, is that ultrasound cannot see through bones or through air, and the heart is covered by bones and air. So it's, it's difficult to look into the heart. And so you have to exhale and so on. So it's difficult if you want to do exercise tests where people are running, for example, and you, you want to do ultrasound during that. It can be complicated, but I think we, we might end up finding a way, and ultrasound would be the ideal technique for such uh, dynamic uh, imaging. The question there? Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question about ultrafast imaging. It has been some years that uh, the technique has emerged, uh, actually quite some years now, and it has not translated to clinical, uh, not what I heard. What is the biggest uh, slowing down? Is it money, because it costs a lot of money, or are people reluctant to use it? Um, so <laughs> at the risk of, of being uh, maybe uh, chased after afterwards, I think Manufacturers play a big role uh, in this, and they, they already have a really good and established business with standard machines. And because we still don't know what direct clinical benefit ultrasound, uh, ultrafast ultrasound will bring in, uh, it's not worth reinventing or re-engineering all the machines to include that. Uh, so most of the machines where people uh, do these things are uh, like uh, smaller companies or research prototypes. Uh, that said, I think uh, it's just the cycle of industry. So you, people are already doing ultrafast ultrasound with uh, big manufacturers in, in the research labs, but that naturally will take uh, perhaps six, seven years in, until it makes it into a product. And it's, it's, it's just uh, the, the cycle of, uh, uh, of industry. So, so it, it, I don't think it's slowing down. I think it will come up eventually. It's just uh, these two factors. Other questions? Maybe also when we're talking about companies, maybe I think it's worthwhile if you share us a little bit of your experience in the beginning to try to work with this type of imaging data because I think a lot of us would struggle with that. It's like, as you say before, it's like if you want to do research into the imaging or kind of a different reconstruction of the imaging, you need to get to the data. And as mm. you say, like with a high frame rate, indeed there's a couple of experimental systems that if you have enough grant money, you can try to get it. But yeah. in order to get things out of the clinical ones and then to see how the interaction with companies goes, I think it's an interesting experience that I know that you have. So maybe you can explain yeah. it slightly or shortly to uh, 
Yeah, yeah, okay. So what, one thing to know about ultrasound is it has been around for maybe widespread in the clinics 30 years or even more, uh, but it has always been a real-time imaging modality. So at the time, with the computers that were available, it was really challenging to, to do this real-time imaging and rendering and so on. So companies had all sorts of patents and uh, IP protection over how they did that, because that actually made the, the difference between a machine that can be used and a machine that cannot be used. Uh, so I think as an inheritance of that, uh, ultrasound companies have been more protective, perhaps, than MRI or CT company. Well, I don't know about CT, but pro definitely uh, that MRI. Um, so most manufacturers have the data stored in a way that you can only see with their own software. Uh, and, and this can be frustrating for ultrasound. So in my personal experience, uh, I had to sort of do reverse engineering many times to try to figure out how data was stored and try to pull it out and spend lots and lots of energy and time trying to chase after people in the in companies to make uh, agreements, to have access to the data and so on. Um, so I, I, I don't think that has changed in the last 10 years, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, if you have a good agreement with a company and they are happy to collaborate with you, then you can have access. So the access is there, it's not that it's not available, it's available but not given to anyone, uh, uh, unfortunately, and that's a fact. Um, I think it's, it's not that we, we, we probably don't, uh, it's, it's not fair to blame only the companies for this, but they, they surely play a big role. Now that new prototype machines are coming out and in a very open way, I think this is uh, making companies rethink how they deal with this data. So hopefully for you it will be less of a problem than it was for me. Uh, but I think if you're gonna start a new project in ultrasound, uh, before you start, make sure that you will have access to the data because otherwise it can cause a big pain and delay. <laughs> And maybe also like you really work in the hospital, how is the interaction with the cardiologist going on? It's like, is it you that present like say, let's try this? Or do they come with a problem that you try to solve? It's like, what's the way to do this type of research in close collaboration? So um, I think you, you have to, in, in my case, you have to spend a lot of time in the clinic. Uh, so we are lucky enough to be uh, a university, uh, an engineering department based in a hospital. So we have lots of access to clinicians and we, we go to the clinics and we are there while they do the exams. Uh, so this allows us already to, th to see what uh, things could be improved. And then I, I think you really have to listen to clinicians because we have different concepts of what is something cool and important. And an example of this is we as engineers like all this visualization where you see vortices and things going from one place to another. But most clinicians just want something that tells yes or no. Like, do I have to do surgery? Yes or no. I don't care what the vortex uh, is swirling or if you are using particle tracking or streamlines or path lines or whatever. Uh, so it, it's very important to understand that what clinicians want is not what you want, but that whatever you do is, is, can be useless if, if clinicians don't like it because then they won't use it. So what we do is, is we make sure we have a system that can get the data quickly from the machine and that we can process this data quickly. Uh, and then the best is to just show anything you have, regardless of whether it's very preliminary to clinicians, as soon as you can. Uh, and then it's a closed loop feedback. Um, and, and that way you, you can come up with something that is useful. Uh, also, I find it very useful to go to clinical conferences as well, just to see what, uh, that, that will give you an idea of what they think is, is more important. And normally you see techniques that were shown in technical conferences uh, two, three, four years ago. Uh, it's the time it takes to make it to something clinically useful. So uh, I, I would definitely recommend you do that if you can. Yeah, we're still waiting for the next presentation to be ready. So we have still a bit of okay, more time cool. to discuss. So if there's other questions. I like your comment about machine learning and I wanted to ask you uh, what is your feeling about uh, deep learning and uh, consider all the um, advances now that has been done in recently. So, yeah, I, I think this is a very important question and even more so for ultrasound. So the one thing to, to always keep in mind about deep learning in particular is that you normally need a huge amount of data uh, and basically it consists of learning from a huge amount of data, hopefully labeled data, but maybe not necessarily. And ultrasound can actually be ideal for that because you can generate a lot of data. 
So we, we have a clinic for, uh, actually for fetal imaging. It's not cardiac imaging, but it's fetal. And we acquire data in real time with a normal system. It's not an ultra-fast ultrasound. But because we are constantly acquiring all the data uh, during an hour or so, we end up with uh, about 20, 30, 40 gigabytes of images for each patient. So uh, actually not for, no, sorry, it's 20 gigabytes of images, about 40,000 images for one patient. So 40,000 images is a lot of data. Uh, it's not data of, uh, of a group or, or representing variability within a group, but it's for one specific patient. But it's something that normal ultrasound systems can do. So I think if you have a way of exploiting that from a machine learning perspective, that has a, a huge potential. Um, then apart from that, the other thing with ultrasound is it, it, uh, it's a real-time modality and things are done in the clinic. So if you want to do machine learning based on annotated data, it gets a bit complicated because then you, ha you need that people annotate the data as it is acquired. Uh, people do take some annotations such as measurements or labeling different organs and so on, so you can use that. But if you want uh, things like segmentations and so on, then it's, it's, it's actually a problem not only in ultrasound, in medical imaging, and this is why we are lagging with respect to computer vision. Um, there is not so much annotated data yet. And, and the data that there is is not publicly available so easily because it's a bit sensitive data from patients and so on. So I think once we solve these two issues, and uh, we at King's, uh, together with Imperials, we are working, for example, things like, um, how do they call this? Uh, crowd, uh, crowd labeling or something, uh, which basically is making available data or parts of data to everywhere, everyone, uh, just to make sure that everyone can label a bit so that in the end, a lot of data will be labeled. And I guess this is like uh, tagging people in Facebook. So if many people tag many people in Facebook, then you have a huge database, yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you need uh, these two things uh, uh, for, for using this uh, deep learning in, in ultrasound. I think also talking about this is like you said in the beginning that when still most used measurements or images that are taken are like the pulse dopplers from valves and things like that. And it's especially looking at patterns. Which there is, it's like currently in clinical practice, they would just do two measurements and they try to learn from the pattern what they, whatever they see based on their experience. Mm. But isn't this also like a, a kind of potential application for more like machine learning, whatever type it would be? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, so uh, I, I guess the, the, the way I see this is if you can sort of translate into a machine the, the techniques that people apply to data based on what they have learned from books or from universities. So if you can train a machine to do those things, then you can use machine learning for that. And it doesn't need to be necessarily deep learning, but it can, can be deep learning. Um, the other very interesting thing about deep learning is that uh, also some work we have been doing when, if you can use neural, for example, convolutional neural networks to uh, do segmentation of, on data, not only you will get segmentation, but you will uh, get patterns uh, of how does the network recognize your image. Or in other words, you will locally see what parts of the image have made uh, the network, for example, classify your image or, or carry out your segmentation. And this basically will give you an idea of what makes the machine think that this is a, a four chamber view, for example. And actually that correlates quite well with anatomy. So this could be used as well, uh, basically trying to dig into the networks and see, not see them as a black box, but rather as something that is uh, mapping the image in some way. And then you, you can learn, uh, you can do all fancy things with that as well. How do you compare the 4D ultrasound versus against uh, 4D MRI for the same patient? And yeah, yeah. So, yeah, actually I have. Um, and the, the result is that they, they are very difficult to compare. <laughs> and uh, there's no ground truth, so it's very difficult to know which one is better. Uh, so maybe I can give you the conclusions I got to. So the first conclusion is uh, if you want to compare them just uh, side by side, uh, so to say, uh, you will notice that MRI visually is much more pleasant. It looks much better, uh, it, partly because it's uh, smooth and nice. And I'm not totally convinced that this means also that it's more accurate. Uh, 
or at least not for this reason. I think in, in general, it, it probably is more accurate than for the flow from echo. Um, so this is one thing. The other thing is that you are measuring slightly different things. So with MR, you are measuring displacement based on phase uh, shift or phase contrast of, uh, of the spin as the particles move. And with ultrasound, you are looking at waves and uh, that have a history. So they have propagated to the transducer in a different way. So there will be artifacts affecting how they are uh, captured. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is if you want to compare them point-wise, so this vector with this vector and so on over the entire image, which might be more interesting, uh, then you have to solve first the problem of aligning MR and ultrasound. And that is very complicated. So we have some work done earlier this year where we tried to do this just for anatomical comparison, not for flow. And after using lots of methods that are available there, we found out that the most reliable way of aligning ultrasound and MRI is manually. So just by picking landmarks uh, with a clinician. And that just works so good. <laughs> uh, or the other methods work so badly, uh, except for a few cases that people use to publish papers. Um, uh, but can you delete this from the video? <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, it's a difficult task, okay? And um, so then the third thing is if you want to compare 40 flow uh, in MRI and ultrasound on real patients, then you have to acquire the data in the same conditions. And this is very difficult. So for starters, in MRI, people are lying on their back. In ultrasound, you will be laying on, on your side. Uh, then in MRI, if it's, for example, small children, they will be uh, under general anesthesia. So if you want to have the patients as well under general anesthesia and ultrasound, well, it's tricky, but you normally won't get that. Uh, then under anesthesia is, uh, you, well, it's limited how representative of the actual flow uh, it is. Uh, then of course you have to acquire things on the same day. So the, the, it, it's very difficult, I think. Uh, and then we, we did some work trying to, to do this comparison on phantom data, uh, because I think that's the, the proper way to do it, uh, because it will solve all these issues. And it's really difficult to come up with a phantom that you can see both in ultrasound and MRI. Uh, so we, we, we have tried quite hard and not been very, very successful yet. Uh, but uh, th yeah, it's an open question. So the short answer is they are a bit different uh, and probably Doppler is still not as accurate as MRI. Maybe a last question, we're almost ready with the next talk is like, what you presented and also where you're working is very much related to pediatric cardiology. Is there any reason why for this type of uh, kind of things you see in the literature predominantly pediatric cardiology rather than adult cardiology, which should be much bigger, no? Yeah, yeah, actually that's a very good point. Uh, well, I, so it's true, m most of my work is in pediatrics. The, actually, my exposure to adult data is more with uh, volunteers when we try methods. And generally, pediatric data in ultrasound is of better quality because uh, they have less fat, the heart is less deep, so there's less attenuation. Uh, things are easier to contain within the field of view of the ultrasound uh, uh, first one because it's smaller hearts. Um, and that I think that generally makes it easier to work in ultrasound with uh, pediatrics. Uh, plus the fact that it is more difficult to work in MRI with pediatrics because uh, you need to do general anesthesia on patients. Uh, the fact that the heart is uh, smaller is a problem in MRI. So it's, it's like a good complementary uh, situation between the two techniques. Uh, so I think perhaps the, 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 uh, the fact or, or the reason, oh, well also it's very difficult to do in, in some patients in adults, uh, particularly big patients, uh, where you have uh, a big uh, f uh, layer of fat or, or the heart is very deep uh, or they have big lungs because then you have lots of artifacts. So generally, if you can make a technique work in adults, it will also work in children, uh, imaging-wise, uh, with ultrasound, and the converse is not necessarily true. Uh, so that probably is uh, something to take into account. Uh, and the same goes, of course, uh, ultrasound and Doppler ultrasound or anatomical ultrasound. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the extensive questioning and your <laughs> <Happy>. experience. <laughs> I think it's really important also for the students to know what all this involves. Eh? It's like really, it's very interesting to see this kind of images and especially ultrasound, a lot is going on, but there's also a lot behind it. And a lot of these things is like you really have to 
try to collaborate with the medical doctors, see which is the field you can get. You have to fight with the companies and things like that. So yeah. it's challenging, but it's actually also really kind of fruitful and very rewarding. Yeah. Okay, thank you very okay. much. Thank you. And we can